Happy Independence Day, and speaking of freedom, our most fundamental American value is on the docket this November, and former President Trump and sitting President Biden finally hit the debate stage last week for the 2024 election. Who won the debate, and what in the world is going on in the Democrat Party and the mainstream media? I'll explain it all today. I'm Blake Watson, and this is We the Free. One of the best ways that you can help our show other than by sharing today's episode is by picking up some We The Free merch at wethefreeshow.com. You can be the salt and light you were meant to be by wearing the salt and light shirt or by sipping your coffee from the salt and light mug. You can sport the God Bless America shirt and of course, the classic We The Free Crest tee. We've even got stickers and a Smells Like Freedom candle. That's right. So check out our merch today at wethefreeshow.com. Well, I'll be turning the young to some and old to others age of 32 this month, but I've, I've noticed throughout my life that I have an uncommon capacity for remembering things. I've always been able to retain and recall things from memory quite well, even little details, some useless details, and, and maybe that will begin to slip away as I age. But, you know, I can at least remember in fairly clear detail, the events of 2019, I mean, it was just five years ago, my wife and I were in our fourth year of marriage, and though we rented our first house, we were living in our first built home with our firstborn, who was a year old at that point. Uh, this was also the year that Joe Biden, after having been in government for 48 years, announced his run for office for the third time. He ran in 1987, but kind of had to drop out after too many controversial accusations of plagiarism and lying about his academic record. He ran again in 2008, but withdrew after the first caucuses in Iowa from too little support. Of course, President Obama would select him as his running mate. And here we go in 2019, third time's a charm. Well, at that point, Biden was already 76 years old and was clearly advancing, or you could say declining, into the throes of cognitive disability. What we would typically classify as something like onset dementia or Alzheimer's. Listen, I, I've lost two beloved family members to these terrible, torturous diseases. The church that I grew up in, we used to frequent uh, visiting nursing homes and and senior facilities to, to visit the elderly, the sick, and the dying. In 2019, Biden was demonstrating the early signs of cognitive decline through his, his physicality, his energy, but most of all through the things that he was saying. The stories made no sense and, and served really no purpose. And after the primaries, he virtually campaigned as little as possible and conducted much of his public appearance from his basement through video. Of course, you know what happened in 2020. Biden does become the 46th president of the United States, and now, over the course of almost four years, Biden's cognitive decline is known everywhere, around the world, and paints a stark picture from the Joe Biden who ran just five years ago. No, it, it wasn't a cold, and no, it's, it's not a speech impediment. This really is a sad case of someone mentally and physically unraveling before the eyes of the whole world. And there's a whole cabal of people who are forcing us to witness this clown show. I'm sure that most of you watched the debate, or at least you've seen a few clips and highlights. I'm sure you've heard lots of analysis and opinions on who won and how Trump did versus how Biden did. I think that you'll find my analysis today quite different. But before we get to the substance of the debate, we've got to establish a couple things first. First, allow me to quickly describe to you the declinations of cognitive disability. In rare cases, this can begin in someone's 40s, but 
In most cases, these symptoms begin to arise around the age of 65. Memory loss and disorientation, you know, forgetting things more than usual and getting confused about what time it is or where you are, what you were doing. You begin to struggle speaking to find the right words or keep up with a conversation. You begin to have unusual trouble with tasks and judgment and problem solving. As things worsen, uh, one begins to have real sudden changes in mood and, and becomes delusional, irritated, frustrated really easily. They start to get lost, wondering. Uh, they develop motor skill problems or difficulty with physical movement, even walking. Before death comes in these cases, a person with really advanced cognitive decline has severe memory loss, uh, severe disorientation, and a severe loss of physical ability. So they, most of the time, they require the, the full-time care provided by a facility or an at-home service. Why do I say all of that? I, I just want you to remember all the little details. And one more thing. I'm just going to go ahead and, and get this out of the way now. We're, we're going to come back to it later, but let's talk about this for just a second. Joe Biden is the president of the United States of America and the leader of the free world. He is the commander in chief and the elected leader of the Democrat Party. No one decides his run for re-election but him. No one can replace him unless he so chooses. No one can force him to drop out. No one can make him sit this one out. Why? Because he is in charge, and he's been in charge this whole time. No, he is not Obama's surrogate third term. He's far more radical and, and ridiculous than Obama was. Don't let the, the cognitive disability fool you, and don't let the conspiracy theorists talk you into anything else. So let's see if you're paying attention. Who do you think decided to do this debate? Joe Biden did. And why, you know, given his severely weakened state, would he choose to do such a thing? Well, because of his declining poll numbers and his waning support and his dissipating approval. That's why. And there's probably another reason. Because any logical advisor and political strategist would have advised against doing this. But Joe Biden is an egomaniacal monster. You think Donald Trump is bad? You think he's a narcissist? Joe Biden is far worse, not to mention his wife, which is why he thinks he can still go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the street fighter from Queens. How do I know this? Well, for one, it's been reported by numerous outlets, but it's also evident by the unusual scheduling of, of the first debate months earlier than the standard debate schedule. Usually, the presidential and, and vice presidential debates take place after the nominating conventions. The RNC meets in July, the DNC meets in August. That means the debates would typically happen in September or October in the final stretch before the general election. The consensus has been Biden wanted to debate, but in order to recover from any significant damage to the campaign, they needed recovery time. Four months is enough time for, for much of the public to forget any significant blunders and mistakes or missteps on the stage with Trump. So no, it doesn't have anything to do with the Democrats setting some sort of trap for Biden to fail so that they could then replace him or have the replacement on stage for the second debate in August. Biden is on top of the totem pole. He is the one riding the horse. He's not the horse that's being ridden. He makes the decision. But unfortunately for us, he doesn't belong in the Oval Office or, or on the debate stage because he belongs in a retirement home. Here's one of his first responses in the, in the debate. Uh, this is only about 10 minutes in. Take a listen. Making sure that we're able to make every single solitary person uh, eligible for what I've been able to do with the uh, 
with, with, with the COVID, excuse me, with um, dealing with everything we have to do with, uh, look, if we finally beat Medicare. Thank you, President uh, Biden, President Trump. Look, this stuff happened all night long, all night. I could play every single blunder for you, but I'm not gonna do that. So, okay, just just one more. Look, there's so many young women who have been, including a young woman who just was murdered and he, he went to the funeral. Uh, the idea that she was murdered by, a, by, a, by an immigrant coming in, to, they talk about that. But here's the deal. There's a lot of young women who are being raped by their, by their in-laws, by their, by, by their spouses brothers and sisters by just it's, it's just ridiculous and they can do nothing about it and they try to arrest them when they cross state lines. thank you for context that was a question about abortion and biden responded with something about immigrants and and women being raped by their siblings and then says something about them getting arrested for crossing state lines all right, just, just one more blunder clip, but listen, this is the last one, cut three, go. You're in a situation where there are 40% fewer people coming across the border illegally. That's better than when he left office. And I'm gonna to continue to move until we get the total ban on the, 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 the total initiative relative to what we're gonna do with more border patrol and more uh, asylum officers. President Trump. Uh, I really don't know what he said at the end of that sentence. I don't think he knows what he said either. Look. Seriously, guys, that, that was the last one. I can't do any more. We have to get to the real substance of the debate. No, in, in, in all seriousness, this is, this is one of the most important things about this election. We, we have a corrupt man who is the current head of state, whose current state of head is more corrupt than ever. Biden's best day was yesterday. And if Trump wants the presidency back, he's going to have to pry it from Biden's decrepit fingers. Look, I, I promise that we're gonna get to the substance, but there's, there's something that we have to come to grips with here. The Biden family had a private meeting this week to make a decision about the future. And, and this was days after this performance. I've only shown you about a minute and 18 seconds of it, and yet they decided they're not going anywhere. Joe's not dropping out. Why, why is Jill Biden out there stumping more than usual right now? Why, why is Obama stumping for Biden more than usual? Well, I, I think it's because they're scared. Scared of what? You know, in separate interviews, and, and even during this debate, Trump is asked about retribution if he wins. And it's a loaded question, which, which I'll interpret for us. They're asking him, are you going to come after us like we came after you? Did you know that you can go to oversight.house.gov and see an entire timeline of the Biden family's foreign influence peddling? Oh, and also on the government website, you can find information on the investigations into their foreign business dealings and classified documents, DOJ and IRS misconduct and weaponization with respect to Hunter, Hunter's art transactions, influencing big tech platforms, and more. And we're talking about Joe Biden, James Biden, his brother, and Hunter Biden, his son. Now, Set all those investigations aside and take a broader look at this. There has been a new precedent set by the Democrats over the last year or so, and that is weaponizing the justice system to eliminate and or destroy political opponents, even if that means prosecuting former presidents over ridiculous charges, which continue to fall through. Does that mean that if Donald Trump wins, that he'll use his own DOJ to come after Biden or Obama over their genuinely high crimes and misdemeanors while in office? My point is, Biden is digging in his heels because he's in trouble. His polling is in trouble, and his family is in trouble. 
That's why he did the debate. That's why he's not going anywhere. Now, we'll talk more about the Democrats' options later, despite all of this at the end. But for now, let's, let's take a look at Biden's first question about his economic performance. We got to take a look at what I was left when I became president, <laughs> what Mr. Trump left me. We had an economy that was in free fall. The pandemic was so badly handled. Many people were dying. All he said was, it's not that serious. Just inject a little bleach in your arm. You'll be all right. The economy collapsed. There were no jobs. Unemployment rate rose to 15%. It was terrible. And so what we had to do is try to put things back together again. And that's exactly what we began to do. We're in a situation where if you had to take a look at all that was done in his administration, he didn't do much at all. By the time he left, there were things were in chaos, literally chaos. And so we put things back together. We created, I said, those jobs. We make sure we had a situation where we now, we brought down the price of prescription drugs, which is a major issue for many people. This, this, ladies and gentlemen, was aptly the first question because it's one of the most important issues. So let's rip all of this economic talk apart and just forget for a moment that Biden, once again, repeated the lie about injected bleach to deal with COVID, but on the economy, comparing Trump to Biden economically, and this is from the NASDAQ, the nominal GDP has remained relatively the same from Trump to Biden. Inflation is almost 4% higher under Biden. The poverty rate has risen under Biden. The only statistic that numerically favors Biden is unemployment. But those numbers are misleading for a couple reasons. Prior to COVID, President Trump's economic policy created 5.2 million jobs. In fact, unemployment, listen to me, Unemployment was at a 50-year low. A 50-year low in February of 2020. Then the pandemic led to more than 20 million Americans losing their jobs, and unemployment rose to the highest it's been since the Great Depression at 14.7%. And that was in the summer of 2020 when Trump was basically you know, nearing his, his, the end of his presidency. And by mid 2021, over 80 million Americans, 80 million unemployment claims were made. Who was hit the hardest? Americans who worked in leisure and hospitality, millions of Americans who worked in restaurants, hotels, and entertainment venues were laid off. Retail workers inevitably lost their jobs from store closures and significantly reduced consumer spending, the utter disruption to supply chains across the board affected jobs in manufacturing and construction. In other words, the offset of job growth was not from poor policy in, in the Trump administration. It was from a worldwide pandemic. So it's actually unbelievable that Trump still had the unemployment and job numbers that he finished with. The real point here is that it's incredibly easy for Biden to go out there and boast about job growth when the vast majority of jobs are simply Americans getting new jobs after the layoffs of the pandemic. And that's without counting additional jobs, as in second or third jobs to make ends meet right now. This is what Trump repeat repeatedly referred to as bounce back jobs under Biden. With that understanding, no person can really take credit for the natural rebound of the post-pandemic economy. Now let's talk more about inflation. You hear about these inflation numbers, like Trump's average was 1.4% and, and Biden's is 5%, though in, back in 2022 it was all the way up at 8%. Inflation is a percentage rate. Rising inflation means that the costs for standard goods and services are going up. They refer to this stuff as a, a basket of goods, but it's the stuff that everybody needs. Bread, milk, gasoline, electricity, water, etc. So as the cost of those things go up, you'll see the inflation number rise. 
Okay, so we understand that, right? So what causes inflation? Well, there are two main factors outside of the expected inflation of just a free market system. And these can be very simply explained as number one, cost, and number two, demand. But what do both of those terms mean? Whenever the demand for goods and services, the demand, exceeds the supply available to Americans, inflation will go up. That's the simple economics of supply and demand. When the cost of production goes up, as in it's more expensive for the producers, the manufacturers, to make things, inflation goes up then as well. Why are the inflation rates so different between Trump and Biden? Well, there are a number of reasons, but a few really important reasons that we need to talk about today. Let's ask this question first. How did inflation jump from Trump's 1.4% to Biden's 8% in less than three years? I'll give you one example and, and probably one of the more important examples. So let's, let's just consider a couple of the most important industries in the United States, oil and food. One thing that most Americans can feel in their pocketbooks and in their wallets and their bank accounts are the costs of food and gasoline amongst just about everything else. By the time I'm finished explaining this, you'll not only understand Biden inflation, but you'll see how the rising cost of just one industry impacts all of the rest. So for this exercise, let's attempt to get some food from the farm to your kitchen table. Obviously that starts with the farmer. The farmer relies on machinery and equipment to produce the food which feeds America. Tractors, harvesters, tillers, drillers, plows, and, and more are, are the necessary machines to cultivate and farm the amount and the quality of food produced in the United States. And what does every bit of that machinery run on? Gasoline or diesel. And you know, oil is used in a lot of stuff here. It's not just what fuels our cars and trucks and tractors. Oil is used for jet fuel, motor oils, hydraulic fluid and grease. That's stuff that has to do with vehicles. But it makes plastics like polyethylene and polypropylene and PVC. It makes nylon, polyester and acrylic. So much of our clothing is, is made from oil. It makes fertilizers. It's in pharmaceuticals and detergents. It's in paving materials, roofing materials, paint, adhesives, and here's another big one, it's in rubber. It's in cosmetics like lipstick, lotion, and cream. It's in shampoo, conditioner, and soap. This is gonna take too long to come through, so I'm just gonna fly through a list real quick. Heating oil, bottles, bags, carpet, ammonia, aspirin, antihistamines, antibiotics, makeup, sunscreen, laundry detergent, paint thinner, hoses, belts, glues, tapes, candles, plastic wrap, bubble wrap, foam packaging. All of these things contain petroleum. In fact, the American Petroleum Institute estimates there are over 6,000 products that use oil in some form. So remember that we're, we're talking about inflation here. One of the central causes of inflation is supply and demand. This demonstrates that the demand for oil is extremely high in America. In fact, it's the most important facet of the American economy. So if you were to, let's say, increase the supply of oil, the entire economy would benefit from it. So let's return to our exercise. The farmer plants, cultivates, and harvests the food. He uses his machinery to accomplish this. If oil is cheaper as a consequence of higher supply, it costs the farmer less to produce the food. The farmer then loads his product onto a supply chain vehicle, you know, like a tractor trailer, let's say. 
since oil supply is high, the trucking company doesn't have to spend as much uh, money to drive your food to the store. So, so far, that's two ways that the cost of oil has affected your food. The grocer, then, is able to purchase the food at a significantly lower price, who is then able to sell you the food for a lower price, and now you're feeding, you're feeding your family at half the cost. And all of this because the supply of oil is high. But there's another way that this could go. Let's say that the government slapped all sorts of regulation on the petroleum industry, making it far more difficult to obtain supply. Well, then it costs the farmer more to operate his farm, which then costs the shipper more to deliver, which costs the grocer more to stock, and finally, it costs you two to three times as much to feed your family. Coincidentally, Neither of those exercises are a fictional tale. The former president, Donald Trump, completely unleashed the oil industry, enabling them to not only reach record levels of supply, but to reach the point of foreign import irrelevance, as in, we didn't need oil imports. We were obtaining so much oil in America that the United States was set to begin exporting oil. Since oil is in over 6,000 products in America, but also impacts every other industry in the United States, inflation stayed down and the economy thrived. On Biden's first day in office, he revoked the permit for the Keystone XL pipeline, which would have transported oil in the most environmentally friendly process, easier from Canada to the United States. He suspended new oil and gas leases on federal lands and waters where crude oil and fossil fuels are extracted from the earth. His administration has delayed permits for other entry infrastructure and and pipelines. This all led to draining our strategic petroleum reserves, which Trump had replenished, and that's potentially compromising emergency energy and national security. He begged foreign countries like Saudi Arabia Iran, and Venezuela for their oil and and more oil, he constantly repeated the refrain, no more drilling, and rejoined the United States to the Paris Climate Accords. All of that signals to the whole industry that more regulations are coming, and all of this was during the beginning of Biden's presidency. When gas prices were at their worst ever, worst ever in American history. It was summer of 2022. And don't forget, I referenced 2022 earlier as the year of the highest inflation, Bidenflation. The average price of a gallon of gas was just over $5 in 2022. That's an all-time record. That year, Forbes magazine reported, if you are a refiner, forecasting billions in losses, and you require massive investments in order to keep your refinery operating safely and in compliance with the laws, you may very well make the decision to close down. Or you have to jack the price up to survive because federal regulations have stifled your ability to reach the necessary supply levels. So folks, It's not just happenstance that under President Trump, your gasoline was around $2 a gallon, and under President Biden's terrible economic and environmental policy, the costs doubled. Supply and demand. Cost of production. When supply is low and demand is high, it costs more to produce. Inflation skyrockets. And that, my friends, is why there is a direct connection between Biden's regulations and revocations and the immediate rise in fuel costs and everything else. That's why inflation was at its highest in recent history when gas was the highest it's ever been. Now, I'm not done with this yet. Booming inflation is met with the blunt force of interest rates exacted by the likes of of the Federal Reserve. Without getting too deep into the weeds, if you wanna go purchase a house right now, you're going to take out what is typically a 30-year mortgage or a loan from the bank, 
but slapped onto that is the interest rate, which as of this week, I checked, it's 7%. That means over the 30 years of paying for your house, you're paying an additional 7% on top of that, which is divided over the course of your monthly payments. So let's say that you pay a quarter million dollars for a house. You'll end up paying $267,000. Why does the Federal Reserve do this? Rates are lowered to make loans and, and credit cheaper, encouraging everyone to spend money and invest more. Rates are raised to discourage spending and investment. Why on earth would we discourage spending? Because rates are adjusted in order to control inflation. When inflation is high, you know, let's say it's at 8%, then the feds will raise the rates, the interest rates, to slow the economy down and decrease demand. Remember what we talked about. When my wife and I bought our first house, interest rates were close to 2%. And when COVID hit, rates were lowered to less than 1%. Now, they've more than tripled. And why? Because of Joe Biden and his stupid policies. I'm still not done. That, ladies and gentlemen, is only one, one of the central reasons for our current economic turmoil. But let's consider some other factors. I know this is a lot, but it's all important, so stay with me. A debate has been broiling for decades over the economic pros and cons of taxes. I'm going to preface this with the three spheres of the United States. There is, number one, we the people, number two, our government, and number three, both of which are the United States of America. Lower taxes will, at face value, increase your disposable income. You. You've got more money to spend. The, the company that you work for has more money to pay you, more income, and deliver you more benefits because uh, they're having to pay less to the government, uh, governments, federal, state, and local. That aspect is what inspires investment and entrepreneurship. If it costs less to run a business, more businesses will be created, more jobs will be created, and everybody gets better pay and benefits. That's how lower taxes affect we the people in the short term. Critics, however, argue that in the long run, in the long term, lower taxes have a negative effect and that higher taxes provide the government, that's bubble number two, the revenue it needs. Proponents of higher taxes also say it helps reduce budget deficits for the, for the government and the national debt, which then creates economic stability and lower interest rates. They would then conclude that higher taxes is actually a long-term benefit to we the people because government spending is contributing less to the national debt and results in lower interest rates, not to mention more money for government programs. So who's right? And which is better for the whole sphere of the United States? The people and, and their government. Ronald Reagan inherited one of the worst economies in American history. Reagan's tax cuts spurred massive economic growth. Bill Clinton raised taxes, and yet there was still economic growth. George Bush lowered taxes to mixed reviews, and in 2017, President Trump lowered taxes under the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. Trump's lowered taxation surely contributed to his GDP, the employment rates, which was at a 50-year low in February of 2020, record median household income in 2019. Um, and then President Biden has raised a few odd taxes, but seeks to raise them across the board, from corporate taxes to individual taxes, uh, social security taxes, and more. President Biden, however, has essentially taxed everything by way of inflation. But you can basically see that Republicans like to lower taxes, and Democrats like to raise taxes. But looking back through the economic history, it's hard to tell which is better because honestly, it just depends on who is in charge, what the budget is, and who's in Congress. 
There's a lot of factors. However, there does seem to be a sort of sweet spot for finding the right tax rate for the whole American sphere. Have you ever heard of Arthur Laffer? He was an economist in the 1970s who came up with something known as the Laffer Curve, which illustrates the relationship between tax rates and tax revenue. Americans want more money in, in their bank account and, and in their spending pockets, and the government needs tax revenue to function properly. So take a look at the screen because this is what Arthur came up with, and I'll explain it for those of you that are listening on audio. Starting from the bottom left, you see a 0% tax rate, and as the tax rate increases, tax revenue does as well. But there's a turning point in the middle of tax increases where tax revenue begins to decline. In other words, what you can see on the graph is that a certain level of taxation leads to optimal government tax revenue, but if you raise taxes too high, tax revenue shockingly plummets in proportion. So the Laffer curve demonstrates that there are limits to how much revenue can be raised and generated through higher taxes. His research and theory has borne itself out as the graph demonstrates that lowering excessive taxes stimulates economic growth and shockingly higher tax revenues not lower that's right as you ease tax rates to the left side of the curve you actually earn higher tax revenues by lowering taxes now obviously this is a very simplified explanation of, of taxation and the economy but reflecting on the last seven administrations seems to give it some validity. Now, just a couple more metrics on the economies of Presidents Trump and Biden. There's two more contributing factors when considering the economic success of an administration, and these are the federal deficit and the national debt. The deficit, simply explained, is how, how much the government spent versus how much they gained in revenue. How much was spent versus how much was earned. A deficit occurs when the government outspends the amount it takes in by revenue. The national debt is a complicated issue that we don't have enough time for today, but it is at least the long-term accumulation of deficits and indebtedness to our creditors. I'll say it that way. Let's just put it that way for now. Let's actually start with President Obama. He came into office as the housing market crashed and the United States was entering into a major recession. Obama's first year in office saw a federal deficit of over $1.4 trillion. In fact, his first four years, his first term, saw a deficit of over a $1 trillion every year. This is in large part due to the economic situation at the time. Remember all of the stimulus, remember the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, and then there's a switch in 2013 where there remained significant deficits, but half of what they were. Is that because the economy was recovering? Well, if, if that was so, then you would see a slightly more gradual decrease in deficit spending rather than cutting the deficit in half. So what was the, the marked difference here? Perhaps it was from the newly elected Republican House. Congress is the one who approves the federal budget. So maybe that's why we went from over a trillion dollars in 2012 to 679 billion in 2013, and then it dropped to 485 billion in 2014, 438 billion in uh, 2015, and 585 billion in 2016. In the end, Obama would contribute over $9 trillion to the national debt. Let me say that again. $9 trillion to the national debt. In 2017, Donald Trump came into office and the government had a federal deficit that year of $665 billion. In 2018, a federal deficit, they had a federal deficit of $779 billion. Again, these are billions with a B. And then in 2019, the government had a budget deficit of $984 billion. Now watch this. In 2020, the federal deficit 
was over $3 trillion. Why in the world would that have happened? You guys remember the global pandemic, right? Yeah, well, the government passed massive relief packages, the CARES Act, huge chunks of money to healthcare and public health, unemployment benefits, Operation Warp Speed, increased uh, social safety net programs, etc. Just as you can't deny that Obama's large deficits in the beginning were a consequence of the recession, you can't deny that Trump's massive record-breaking deficit in 2020 was a result of the global pandemic. Otherwise, the deficit would be comparable to Obama's. Now, how about the sitting president, Joe Biden? In his first year, the deficit was $2.77 trillion. The next year, in 2022, it was $1.3 trillion. In 2023, it was $1.55 trillion. And we don't even have the numbers from 2024 yet, but here's the summary so far. I'm just gonna put all that together. Number one, Obama's first term saw a total deficit of $5.09 trillion. In his second term, the government overspent by about $2.2 trillion, bringing Obama's deficit spending to $7.3 trillion. In the total deficit spending in Trump's administration, they overspent, listen to me, $5.5 trillion. So far, Biden's administration in three years has overspent $5.7 trillion. And that's without any of the data from 2024. So let's tie all of this economic investigation up with a nice big bow. Donald Trump cut taxes, unleashed the oil industry, saw historically low unemployment, record median household income, and he threw tons of money at COVID, yet overspent less than Presidents Obama and Biden. Biden has overspent more in three years than Trump did in four years. He stuck a knife in the back of the American economy by shanking the oil industry. He spurred the worst inflation we've seen since the Carter administration. And as a result, everything costs more. It's harder for everyone to make ends meet. Oh, and during the debate, Biden touted his record employment numbers, and Trump rightly pointed out they're all rebounded jobs from the post-pandemic economy. And over the last couple months, I went through all of those new jobs, and they're largely a result of Republican-led states and people leaving blue states for red states and getting different jobs. In other words, Biden lied all night long about his presidential record. Well, look, the greatest economy in the world, he, he's the only one who thinks that, I think. I don't know anybody else who thinks he's he the greatest economy in the world. And, you know, the fact of the matter is that uh, we find ourselves in a situation where his, his economy, he rewarded the wealthy. He had the largest tax cut in American history, $2 trillion. He raised a deficit larger than any president has in any one term. He's the only president other than Herbert Hoover who's had lost more jobs than he had when he began since Herbert Hoover. He, would, he made a statement, the only thing he was right about is I gave you the largest tax cut in history. I also gave you the largest regulation cut in history. That's why we had all the jobs. And the jobs went down and then they bounced back and he's taking credit for bounce back jobs. You can't do that. He also said he inherited 9% inflation. Now, he inherited almost no inflation and it stayed that way for 14 months and then it blew up under his leadership because they spent money like a bunch of people that didn't know what they were doing and they don't know what they were doing. It was the worst, probably the worst administration in history. And he caused the inflation. He's blaming inflation. And he's right, it's been very bad. He caused the inflation and it's killing black families and Hispanic families and just about everybody. It's killing people. They can't buy groceries anymore. They can't, you look at the cost of food where it's doubled and tripled and quadrupled. They can't live, they're not living anymore. He caused this inflation. I gave him a country with no, essentially no inflation. It was perfect. It was so good. All he had to do is leave it alone. He destroyed it with his Green New Scam and all of the other, all this money that's being thrown out the window. He caused inflation. As sure as you're sitting there. There was no inflation when I became president. You know why? The economy was flat on its back. 
15 percent unemployment. He decimated the economy, absolutely decimated the economy. That's why there was no inflation at the time. There were no jobs. Next, President Trump was asked about his plan to impose broad tariffs. Uh, specifically, he was asked about the potential impact higher tariffs would have on average Americans. Not going to drive them higher. It's just going to cost countries that have been ripping us off for years, like China and many others, in all fairness to China. It's going to just force them to pay us a lot of money, reduce our deficit tremendously, and give us a lot of power for other things. Higher tariffs can protect American jobs by making imports more expensive, driving consumers to buy American made. They can generate revenue for the government, which could, as Trump said, diminish the deficit. Higher tariffs could balance our trade deficit, which we have an enormous deficit with China. They can be used to benefit our national security and to be used as leverage in trade negotiations. But if not done well and precisely, higher tariffs can lead to higher consumer prices. We've already seen this happen, though in a really niche sort of way, in Trump's prior trade war with, Ch with China when he was in office. That led to another con of tariffs, which is retaliatory tariffs, which China imposed on us. It cost American farmers and manufacturers more to export things like soybeans and automobiles and pork to China. However, I'll say this, China is killing us on trade and they've been ripping us off for years. You've heard Trump talk about this for almost nine years now, and he's right. What needs to happen economically and as a matter of national security is that we're far less dependent on Chinese imports. That's why in 2018, he raised tariffs on Chinese imports ranging from 10% to 25%. He also imposed a 25% tariff for steel imports and 10% and on aluminum. On those tariffs, critics said it, it raised costs for uh, US manufacturers. And to that, I, I just ask, why are we not using American steel and aluminum? Now listen, this represents a facet of Trump that is very undervalued, and, and that is, Trump never started or perpetuated a militaristic war. Sure, he, he took out specific foreign enemies and targets with military strikes, which is another one of Trump's unpredictable strengths. But he mainly used economic pressure to defeat our enemies or to persuade or dissuade our enemies. Think of it. Using the power of money and trade, Trump had dried up the Iranians, he had North Korea open to trade. He had China cooling off. He had Putin in his place. He had NATO stepping up. The Middle East was signing peace agreements. And that's because of Donald Trump. This provoked the ire of the deep state, Democrats and Republicans, who absolutely love going to war, but regular Americans do not. So to all Americans, I ask, would you rather go to war or would you rather use business, money, and trade to make peace in the world? Do you want to keep buying Chinese garbage or do you want to lower the cost of American-made products? Speaking of wars, Biden told this heinous, damnable lie about his record. You know, when he was president, they were still killing people in Afghanistan. He didn't do anything about that. When he was president, we were still found ourselves in a position where you had a notion that we were this safe country. The truth is, I'm the only president this century that doesn't have any, this, this decade, that doesn't have any troops dying anywhere in the world like he did. You know, I've lived in Coryton, Tennessee since I was about nine years old. It's a sweet little town in North Knoxville in East Tennessee. The same is true for my wife. We grew up here, we went to school here, we got married here. We both work here, we, we raise our kids here. There's a family in our area, the Canals family, who would say pretty much the same thing, but their son, Ryan, is no longer with them or with us because 
He was one of the 13 American soldiers who were killed in the botched withdrawal from Afghanistan. How do you think his mother, Paula, feels about what Biden just said? Here's how Trump responded. Well, we left billions of dollars of equipment behind. We lost 13 beautiful soldiers and 38 soldiers were obliterated. And by the way, we left people behind too. We left American citizens behind. When Putin saw that, he said, you know what? I think we're going to go in and maybe take my, this was his dream. I talked to him about it, his dream. The difference is he never would have invaded Ukraine, never. Just like Israel would have never been invaded in a million years by Hamas. You know why? Because Iran was broke with me. I wouldn't let anybody do business with them. They ran out of money. They were broke. They had no money for Hamas. They had no money for anything. No money for terror. That's why you had no terror at all during my administration. This place, the whole world is blowing up under him. President Biden. I've never heard so much malarkey in my whole life. This is really frustrating. If I could just be open with you all right now. Um, I saw people online saying they're still not changing their minds, that they'll, they'll, they're still gonna vote for Biden. This is what you're voting for. The weakest, most feeble old man in the Oval Office, and Trump is absolutely correct. Afghanistan was a signal to the world to do whatever you want. It was the first domino to fall, and it set off Ukraine and Russia, Iran and Israel, North Korea ramping up mil military production in China toward annexing Taiwan. Trump says the world's on fire under this guy. And, and I know Trump is, is a very exaggerative person, but the point of the statement is true. We have global, not just American, global destabilization because of Joe Biden. Speaking of Israel, Biden bragged about his great plan to save Israel, but I've talked about this over and over. I'm, I'm not going to rehash everything I've said about this situation, but I'll summarize for us now. Israel is surrounded by people who want them dead. They're surrounded by people who think that their God wants them to wipe Jews off the planet. It's not a land dispute. It's not about territory or control. There's no viable solution for a two-state solution. It's been tried over and over again, and the so-called Palestinians reject it every single time. Israel almost never ever goes on the offensive. They're usually assaulted all day, every day, just for existing. But after October 7th, they made an official declaration of war against the terror group and the governing authority in Gaza, Hamas. The only end to this, the only end to this is Hamas's extinction. Trump basically said the same thing. Israel's the one that wants to go. He said the only one that wants to keep going is Hamas. Actually, Israel is the one, and you should let him go and let him finish the job. He doesn't want to do it. He's become like a Palestinian, but they don't like him because he's a very bad Palestinian. He's a weak one. President Biden, you have a minute? I've never heard so much foolishness. Speaking of malarkey, here's what the candidates had to say about their border policies and the immigration crisis at the southern border. Given that, why should voters trust you to solve this crisis? Because we worked very hard to get a bipartisan agreement that not only changed all of that, it made sure that we are in a situation where you had no circumstance where they could come across the border with the number of border police there are now. We significantly increased the number of asylum officers. Significantly, by the way, the Border Patrol endorsed me endorsed my position. In addition to that, we found ourselves in a situation where when he was president, he was taking, separating babies from their mothers, putting them in cages, making sure they were, the families were separated. That's not the right way to go. What I've done since I've changed the law, what's happened? I've changed it in a way that now you're in a situation where there are 40% fewer people coming across the border illegally. That's better than when he left office. And I'm going to continue to move until we get the total ban on the, 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 the total initiative relative to what we're going to do with more Border Patrol and more uh, asylum officers. President Trump? 
Uh, I really don't know what he said at the end of that sentence. I don't think he knows what he said either. Look, we had the safest border in the history of our country. The border, all he had to do was leave it. All he had to do was leave it. Look, basically every bit of what Biden just rambled through is a lie. Donald Trump had the lowest numbers of migrant encounters of the century. Biden has the most, the most migrant encounters in American history. We literally went from the least to the most. Take a look at this graphic from Pew Research. Trump's administration hit two record lows in 2017 and in 2020. As soon as Biden came into office, almost as soon as he came in, border crossings exploded to record highs. That's what you can see on the right side. And that's because he stopped border wall construction, he reversed all the Trump era policies, and he broadcasted to the world that mi casa es su casa. Come on in and put your feet up. Don't worry about wiping your feet off. I, I, I have done full episodes on this subject explaining the Christian and the biblical view on immigration and illegal immigration, the so-called replacement theory, and the actual numbers of illegal voters in the country right now. Just take a, a stroll through my episode history and you'll find all of that. Another topic that we've covered quite a bit is that of abortion. Here's what President Trump said. First of all, the Supreme Court just approved the abortion bill, and I agree with their decision to have done that, and I will not block it. And if you look at this whole question that you're asking, a complex but not really complex, 51 years ago, you had Roe v. Wade, and everybody wanted to get it back to the states. Everybody, without exception. Democrats, Republicans, liberals, conservatives. Everybody wanted it back. Religious leaders. And what I did is I put three great Supreme Court justices on the court, and they happened to vote in favor of killing Roe v. Wade and moving it back to the states. This is something that everybody wanted. Now, 10 years ago or so, they started talking about how many weeks and how many of this and getting into other things. But every legal scholar throughout the world, the most respected, wanted it brought back to the states. I did that. Now the states are working it out. If you look at Ohio, it was a decision that was it was a, an end result that was a little bit more liberal than you would have thought. Uh, Kansas, I would say the same thing. Uh, Texas is different. Florida is different. But they're all making their own decisions right now. And right now, the states control it. That's the vote of the people. Like Ronald Reagan, I believe in the exceptions. I am a person that believes. And frankly, I think it's important to believe in the exceptions. Some people, you have to follow your heart. Some people don't believe in that. But I believe in the exceptions for rape, incest, and the life of the mother. I think it's very important. Some people don't. Follow your heart. But you have to get elected also. And because that has to do with other things. You got to get elected. I've criticized President Trump for this repeatedly. This actually makes my stomach turn to hear people talk about babies as if they're a disease or as if they're just a bodily organ that can be removed or cut off by surgery. I hate the dehumanization of the most fragile life in existence, the most innocent of all human beings. The abortion pill needs to be completely banned because it accounts for over 60%, 60% of abortions. Abortion should be completely illegal and punishable by law. But I understand the political ramifications right now. I understand that. Trump is trying to get elected. In my opinion, is the minority opinion. I acknowledge that. Now, ladies and gentlemen, this is one of the most important issues of our time. Would you rather have a moderate president on this issue who boots the subject off the federal stage and allows federalism to have its practice of states legislating on their own what the Constitution doesn't specify, or do you want this? And if I'm elected, I'm going to restore Roe v. Wade. So that means he can take the life of the baby in the ninth month and even after birth, because some states, Democrat run, take it after birth. Again, the governor, former governor of Virginia, put the baby down, then we decide what to do with it. So he's, in, he's willing to, as we say, rip the baby out of the womb in the ninth month and kill the baby. 
Nobody wants that to happen, Democrat or Republican. Nobody wants it to happen. You're lying. That is simply not true. The Roe v. Wade does not provide for that. That's not the circumstance. Only a woman's life is in danger. She's going to die. That's the only circumstance in which that can happen. But we are not for late-term abortion, period, period, period. Under Roe v. Wade, you have late-term abortion. You can do whatever you want, depending on the state. You can do whatever you want. We don't think that's a good thing. We think it's a radical thing. We think the Democrats are the radicals, not the Republicans. For 51 years, that was the law. 51 years, constitutional scholarship said it was the right way to go. 51 years, and it was taken away because this guy put very conservative members on the Supreme Court. He takes credit for taking it away. What's he going to do? What's he going to do, in fact, if the, if the MAGA Republicans, he gets elected, and the MAGA Republicans control the Congress, and they pass a universal ban on abortion, period, across the board at six weeks or seven or eight or ten weeks, something very, very conservative. Is he going to sign that bill? I'll veto it. He'll sign it. I wish that Biden was right there at the end, but everything he said was a lie. Under Roe, Depending on the doctor, the clinic, the city, or the state, a baby could be murdered full term. That is the Democrat position. No matter what Joe Biden says there. But no, Trump literally just stated that he's for the three exemptions, which I disagree with, and he's fine with the abortion pill. So he's not going to do what Biden and the Democrats are trying to scare everyone with. So in total, they covered almost 20 different but interconnected topics throughout the debate. I think it's overwhelmingly obvious that Trump performed better and that Joe Biden performed abysmally. The minority of people who believe Biden bested Trump are living in an alternate dimension. Now, after the debate, things began to get interesting, let's say. The mainstream media, in virtual unanimity, were aghast at Biden's performance. And I'm not just talking about the, the talking heads on the TV stations and the news shows. I'm talking about journalists and the newspapers and the blogs. I'm talking about the press corps. I'm talking about uh, Democrats in Congress and Democrat advisors and donors, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's as if they only now realized Biden's poor health. And that goes without mentioning his terrible presidential performance. So what is this really about? What is going on? As I started the show by saying, Joe Biden is in charge, okay? No one else gets to decide if he runs for re-election or drops out of the race. Joe Biden makes that choice. So do not buy into any of the spin and hype that Democrats can replace Joe Biden. All that you're seeing right now, listen to me, all that you're seeing right now is the leftist pressure to persuade Biden to step down, to step aside with whatever dignity he has left. And here's the thing, even if that was true, what other person would have the political or electoral weight to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Donaldus Maximus. Not Gavin Newsom and his destructive dictatorial record in California. Not cackling Kamala, the worst diversity hire in history. Not paternity train wreck Pete Buttigieg. Not Michelle Obama or whoever she is. There is no one else the Democrats can go with. I've said all along that their best bet is to get RFK Jr. on their ticket. But they've rejected him from the beginning, which is why RFK is running as an independent and was excluded from the debate last week. In other words, Biden is actually their best shot, which isn't saying much. Now, if I can, again, be open and honest about a concern that I have now, I would appreciate your thoughts on this. The Democrats are at a, a, a serious impasse. They have supported this man from day one, but now they have turned on him and there is no going back. They absolutely hate Donald Trump in the deepest, darkest parts of themselves. They are truly convinced that he is evil and authoritarian. They believe he is an existential threat to the world. 
and the United States. And I'm actually concerned that at this impasse, they will take drastic measures. And I'm not going to sit here and theorize about that, but I think you know what I mean. Hans Christian Andersen wrote a short story in 1837 called The Emperor's New Clothes, which tells the tale of a vain emperor who is obsessed with image. Well, two swindlers come along to take advantage of this. Okay, They offer to craft the emperor the finest and most amazing wardrobe ever created. Not only does this fabric look more beautiful than anything ever made, ever woven, but it appears invisible to anyone who may be an idiot or incompetent or foolish. The emperor is amazed by this and imagines himself parading through the city adorned in this splendid clothing. So the swindlers are commissioned. They pretend to work tirelessly sewing and weaving and stitching with nothing on the machines and nothing in their hands. The emperor is waiting for the job to be finished when it dawns on him, well, wait a second, what if I can't see the clothing? That'll mean that I'm an idiot and I'm, I'm unfit for this job. So he sends a couple of his advisors to inspect the work. The only problem is they don't want to seem like a bunch of idiots either. So they pretend to see how loaded the machines are, oh wow, and and how amazing the the quality of the work is. And so they they go back to report everything to the emperor and everyone in the city has heard about this magic material and the soon coming parade. So everyone at this point has heard about the peculiarities of the material that if you don't see anything, you're an idiot and a simpleton. So the night before the parade, The swindlers pretend to work furiously to to finish the wardrobe. And here's where I'll pick up with the actual text. They say the emperor's new clothes are ready. The emperor, with all the, the grandees of his court, came to the weavers. The thieves raised their arms as as if in the act of holding something up. Here are your majesty's trousers. Here is the scarf. Here is the mantle. The whole suit, as light as a cobweb, one might fancy one has nothing at all on when dressed in it. Yes, indeed, said all the courtiers, although not one of them could see anything of the special cloth. The emperor was dressed for a fitting, and the thieves pretended to array him in his new suit. The emperor turned round and from side to side before the looking glass, How splendid his majesty looks in his new clothes, and how well they fit. Everyone cried out, What a design! What colors! These are indeed royal robes. I am quite ready, said the emperor. He appeared to be examining his handsome suit. The lords of the bedchamber who were to carry his majesty's train felt about on the ground as if they were lifting up the ends of the mantle. Then they pretended to be carrying something, for they would by no means want to appear foolish or or not fit for their jobs. The emperor walked under his high canopy in the midst of the procession through the streets of the capital. All the people standing by and those at the windows cried out, Oh, wow, how beautiful are the emperor's new clothes. What a magnificent train there is to the mantle. And how gracefully the scarf hangs. No one would admit these much-admired clothes could not be seen because in doing so, he would have been saying he was either a simpleton or unfit for his job. And then a little child says this, But the emperor has nothing on at all. The father says, Listen to the voice of the child. What the child had said was whispered from one to another but he has nothing on at all. At last cried out from all the people. The emperor was upset, for he knew that the people were right. However, he thought the procession must go on now. The lords of the bedchamber took greater pains than ever to appear holding up a train, although in reality there was no train to hold, and the emperor walked on in his underwear. 
We have all known all along that Biden was unqualified for office. Not just his horrendous record as a senator and a vice president, but because of his mental collapse. The media and the politicians have been like the emperor's advisors in council. They've known it all along as well. But in order to not upset the emperor or seem like an idiot, they suppress the truth and pretend like Biden is brilliant and healthier than ever, right? We have been like the child who exclaims Biden's nudity. And now word is finally making its way through the crowd despite the procession proceeding through November. And with that, I hope you have a great Independence Day celebration with your families. Thank you to our men and women in service. Thank you to those who sacrificed for our freedom. And thanks be to God who has given us eternal freedom. So that's going to do it for me. What will it be next time? We'll see. For now, go and be the salt and light you were meant to be. And we'll see you next time on We The Free. Thanks for watching this clip. Listen, I want to make sure that you stay informed on the news and the biblical response to it. So do yourself and us a favor and hit the subscribe button before you go. And then we'd love for you to check out wethefreeshow.com to grab yourself some merch or to spread the word of We The Free. And we're also going to put a video on the screen right now that we think that you'll love. Now, go and be that salt and light, and we'll see you next time.